If you don't have a sermon outline, just lift your hand. You will need one. In our church, we study the Bible. We study it rather in depth, and uh, this morning um, will be no different from usual. And so I ask you, if you would, to lift your hand and just receive one of these. Um, I'm going to move very, very quickly this morning, and it's because there are some passages of Scripture that I am going to ask you to turn to in your Bible and notice, and they're going to be toward the end of the message. So I don't want to alarm you and make you think, oh my, what is, it, what is happening? I'm going to move quickly, and so as I do that, I'm doing that asking you to be careful to pay attention to the supporting passages that we read this morning. So I'll go fast if you can listen fast. Can you do that? All right. Let's have that agreement. You stay engaged. And um, we're going to see just a few words here that I believe are very powerful. The title of the message today is, Paul the Slave Qualified to Speak into Your Life. Paul the Slave Qualified to Speak into Your Life. We're going to be looking at this this beginning of this beautiful little three-chapter letter. This is a short letter from Paul to Titus, and it's written to a pastor on the island of Crete. Now, he's kind of a short-term pastor that's being left there to get some things in order for a bunch of churches that have been planted. You remember last week, Crete is this island. It's not Cyprus to the, to, off to the east, but it's, it's kind of in the middle of the med a little bit there, very centrally located with Greece and Turkey. Um, you know, Africa's below it. Egypt, Libya, Tunisia would be below it kind of a crossroads in Roman culture, a beautiful island, 150 miles long, so it's not a small place, has large mountains that are on it with snow-capped mountains in the wintertime. I mean, quite a place, and uh, we looked at a few different pictures last week, a beautiful place. Two or three of you said, hey, I'm going to Crete Um, next vacation, whatever. Well, have at it. It's a beautiful place. Uh, It was a beautiful, beautiful place then. And it is now, but there is evidence that that there were great civilizations there, the Greeks and also the Romans. And some of these would even be churches that were left behind um, from the era that would be following um, Titus's letter, um, Paul's letter to Titus. And so there's ruins that are around on the island that show us the great civilization that was there, the fact that many churches would have been there. This morning we want to look at the beginning of this letter, and we're really going to look at just a few words. And it's because I I hadn't ever noticed this before, but we have never done a book of the Bible so far um, in our main studies that was written by Paul. And so we have, we've had sermons from letters written by Paul here and there, but we've never done a book study from that. You think about it, we've done John, we've done Jude, um, we have looked at the letter of James, um, but we've never looked at a letter from Paul as a book study. And so as we come to Titus, this is by Paul. We want to see his beginning. Now, if, you're, if you have your outline there, just notice there that Titus is one of three pastoral epistles. We talked about the fact that biblical backgrounds is important and understanding the setting is important. That's why we look at the pictures of the island. That's why we look at where it's located. That's why we look at Roman culture. That's why we look at Greek language. That's why we look at the customs that are there. We look at the things that are on the ground so that we can understand what God's Word says. If you come into the life of our church and you see that we study the Bible, we believe that the Bible is really knowable. You can know God's Word. You can study it together. If you read it at home and if you study it here as a part of a church family, you can begin to see and hear God speak to your heart. And we believe that His Word is what brings life. And so we look at this. These are pastoral epistles. What is an epistle? Except that epistle is simply a letter. That's what that means. I use the word epistle just because some of your Bibles say that and you're wondering, what in the world is that? Is that a missile? Is it... I don't know know what that is. Um, We don't use that phraseology anymore. We use the word text, you know? I mean, we text somebody. Well, this is back in the days when people actually had things called pens, and there was paper, and they would write them, or parchment, or various other things that was there um, before the days of screens and tapping and everything else. But notice here with me, we call it, calling it an epistle simply means it's a letter. So you could say, this is Paul's letter to Titus. It's the exact same thing. The epistle to Titus is the same thing. It's a letter 
to Titus. That's what that means. There are three main pastoral epistles from Paul. They are first and second Timothy, and this one, Titus. So Timothy was a young pastor. Timothy was a guy that was a protege of Paul. And so when, when Paul left Timothy in various places, he would write to him a letter telling him what he needed to give attention to in the churches. This is similar except to a different guy. So this is a letter written to Titus. Um, Titus had traveled with Paul. Titus had been left, as we're going to see, um, in Crete to, fi- to shore up some of the churches that are there and to teach and to pastor them along. We do say that Titus was a pastor, not merely a missionary, even though he traveled a lot, because we see his work in this letter as pastoral work. He's been left behind to stay with the church, and we saw last week when we read the whole thing, at one point we see that Paul is saying, you need to give attention to this. You need to be intent on teaching this. Do you remember that part um, where we looked at it last week? He's saying, be intent on making sure that they get this. And so we see that Titus is a pastor to these churches, making sure that they are seeing and understanding the gospel. Before we read it, I want you to notice a couple other things about this. Titus's letter begins with a very formal salutation. What's a salutation? That means a greeting. So it begins with a formal salutation. If you look at that box on the page, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, this is the salutation. This is the, hello, I hope you're doing well. This is the, uh, and it's a little bit more than that, because when you had a scroll, you would put your name as the writer at the first part of it, because if they were undoing the scroll, they wouldn't have to unroll the whole thing to see who is this thing from. And so back in that day, because it would be turned, you would start with the name of who is writing it, and then you would see who it's being written to, and then you would see the content that is there. Um, So this morning as we do that, as we read this, and as we kind of start our study of the salutation, there's a couple of things I want you to notice. Number one, fill this in, the greeting or the salutation is 91 words long in English. So this is a long salutation. It's not a short one. Um, Number two, this is so important. It is absolutely packed with significance. I believe that as we study the book of Titus, and even as we study this greeting over the next few weeks, I believe that you're going to be blown away with what's in here. It is amazing the value that is here for your life in this day and time, and for your walk with God, if we will be still and let the Holy Spirit speak, if we will look at what his word says, understanding that the Holy Spirit never has a stray word. He always intends what he inspires for those who wrote his word, and then he protects it through the ages so that we can have it today. So, number two is this, don't skip stuff like introductions. How many times have you opened a letter and um, you really want to know what the bottom line is. I don't know about you, but I, I usually kind of go, you know, you open it up and you, you kind of start off with something from the, you know, the phone company or from the power company or from your homeowners association or whatever it is, and you go, yada, 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 yada. Okay, now, what they really want is more money for this, or what they really want is, okay, I left my garage door up. I'm not allowed to leave my garage door up. You know, I don't know what the deal is, but uh, you, you kind of look past the salutation very often, not really interested in the details of it. We don't want to do that with this. There's too much here that is important and good Um, for us to miss this. Um, Number three, we're going to notice that the author's name, as we said last week, is Paul or Paulos. Um, And you remember with me that he was formerly who? Saul. Circle that. that. Saul started out a persecutor of the church. He started out as a zealous Pharisee, persecuting these people who were a distraction to the Jewish people. In fact, he was he was really, really happy the day that, stone, the, the day that uh, Stephen got stoned to death. So Paul was a true persecutor of the church. And then, by God's grace, when he was on his way to Damascus to go round up more Christians, 
the Spirit of God shines a light, a blinding light on Paul in midday, knocks him down and speaks to him from the heavens. And this Saul man comes face to face with the glory of God. And here's the word, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? Now, he rightly said, who are you, Lord? I mean, he knew at that moment, I, I'm dealing with something I've never dealt with before. And he says, I am Jesus Christ, whom you are persecuting. And it was that very moment that Saul um, comes to see that the one that he had been um, fighting against was the one who had come to save not only his soul, but to save all of humanity who would come to believe in him and trust in him. And so we see that this great man, Paul, comes um, to write to this young man. Let's read the, the salutation that's there in the box. It's right there on the page. Um, and uh, maybe you're looking at it in your, in your scripture. That, that is great as well. We'll be reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Look what it says in verse 1. Again, the writer's name comes first, Paul. And then he describes himself. A servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now he starts to tell why he's writing. For the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness. Another way of saying that, which brings godliness. It's linked to godliness. Verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted. You see, he's been entrusted with this message by the command of God our Savior. Don't miss God, our Savior. We're going to look at that more in a little bit later. But God, God is the one who comes and saves us. Look at verse 2. To Titus, my true child in a common faith. Now, that doesn't mean a, a not valuable faith. It means that we have the same faith. Grace and peace from God, the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. This morning, we're going to focus on something that is so very, very brief, but yes, yet listen, so pivotal to knowing who God is and knowing who we are and who his people are called to be. And I am afraid that this morning that we're going to look at something that is largely missed, especially in cultural Christianity especially in this present day of an easy believism gospel, in this present day of a world where we are really, really tempted to think about ourselves perhaps more than any other time in human history. We see our culture of the world becoming more and more individualistic even though we are more connected than we've ever been. We become more and more segmented into ourselves, and we become more and more focused. And yes, I even, I even think about those little things that we carry around that we look at a lot. How many times do you notice that human beings had their head down looking at devices, and very often those devices allow us to be very individualistic and quite honestly, very narcissistic. And so, I want us to see that God's Word this morning calls us to be something radically different than our culture is promoting to us. And um, I, I believe that we will see it through Paul's very first words. Notice in number four that's on your outline. We see as this letter starts two cited credentials. And the first one is, he's saying, I am, and the word that is used in the ESV and in many other translations, is I am a servant of God. 
Circle the word servant there on your outline. And he also says, I am an apostle of Christ. Circle that. We're going to deal with the first one this morning. And there's, there could be ten messages on this concept, but we're going to do one. The first credential that Paul gives is that he is a servant of God. The word is doulos. Can you say that out loud together with me? It is doulos. What? That was about half of you. Let's try it again. The word is doulos. And the word doulos means, um, it's a, excuse me, it's translated in this day and time, servant, bondservant, or rarely it is translated slave. Um, so notice that, either servant, bod servant, or sometimes it's, it's translated slave. It occurs 150 times in the Greek New Testament. Now, those of you are wondering, well, why would you care about a Greek New Testament? Well, the Bible was originally, uh, the New Testament was written in Greek. And so if we want to go back to what Paul actually wrote in, what Timothy uh, was reading, what Titus is reading, what the gospel writers are writing in, for the most part, written in Greek in the New Testament. Notice this with me that as we, as we see this, there is something that has come up that I think is so important for Christians in this day, day and time to recognize, and it's this, that there is a translation controversy, if you're from Britain, controversy, um, between servant and slave. Between servant and slave. And it's, it's a very interesting controversy that has come up. It's been about 500 years that English has been really looking at this, and, and this next paragraph is important to us. I want you to see this. Since John Calvin and John Knox, we've studied both of them in October through our, our Reformation studies, since they translated the Geneva Bible in 1560, it has often been translated servant or bondservant when it should be rendered slave. Very often, the translators have translated it into English, and this is an English-specific issue. This is, this is uh, and you say, well, what is, what's the big deal? Servant, slave, both sound horrible to me. Um, well, not really. There's, a, there's very often a huge difference and a spiritual difference in this. Well, why would Calvin and why would Knox have started out with the Geneva Bible, which came um, 60 years before the King James, um, comes out early, comes out before the King, excuse me, 50 years before the King James. King James doesn't come until 1611. And so when you, when you see this, by the time the King James Version was translated, the Geneva Bible had already been out and the King James translators went with what the Geneva Bible had set in motion. Very often, out of this 150 uses, usages of the word doulos, they go more with servant than they go with slave. Now, why would they do that? We know from their writings and we know from other writings that they had debate about it and they talked about it. But what, one of the things that they came to was they thought slave was too belittling or too harsh to refer to Christians consistently. I mean, slave, come on, that's really rough. I mean, we, we don't, at this time in Europe, much, much of slavery was over. Um, by, the, by the 14th century, much of that that had been prominent in Europe was, was not happening. It wasn't until later, as we, as we look at um, the Americas um, and as we look at other imperial um, uh, movement of both Portugal and Spain and Britain and eventually to the American colonies, that there would be a, a great resurgence of slavery. And so we, we see that in this time, they're, they're seeing slavery as, man, that's that's a, that's a really harsh term to consistently be um, translating, and so they were, they were not prone to do that. Now, this is a problem. In fact, this is a problem in several different ways. Problem number one is the fact that doulos means slave in Koine Greek. It very clearly means slave in Koine Greek. In fact, if you look at kettle, which is, kettle is the, 
is the great Greek dictionary, perhaps the foremost authority on, on Greek words and dictionaries. It's a multi-volume set. I saw one last night as I was, as I was preparing for this. It's at $200 for even the set of this massive Greek exhaustive work. It, the, the, the writer in this, in this dictionary says, doulos really very, very clearly means slave. Doesn't matter who has translated it in different ways in the past, it clearly means slave. Number two, there are six other Greek words for servant. There are six other Greek words that could have been used in various instances for servant. And as we, as we look at the vast majority of English, you know, this, this is an English specific issue, as we look at the vast majority of English translations, um, there's only one or two that use slave very much um, in those when, in the, when the word doulos comes up. We're gonna see why this is important in just a minute. Number three, while a slave is always a servant, a servant is not necessarily a slave. I want you to think about that. It's possible um, to be a servant without being a slave, that you may serve in someone's home, and, we, and we, we know that both in Hebrew history and we know in the Greco-Roman world that there, were, there was a difference in servants and slaves, that there was a difference with people who were actually owned like property and people who were employed as servants. And so there is a distinction within that, and there's even other words to deal with that, but as we look at this and as we begin to look at the context of some of these, we will come to see the beauty of what God has done in our salvation. We begin to see the beauty of what he has called us to as Christians. Number four, notice this. Using servant when slave is actually more accurate dilutes, fill that in, it dilutes or it reduces the meaning, the meaning. When we use servant instead of slave, we are watering down the picture of this. This is to show us that we need to pay attention very carefully to the study of God's Word. Now, there's a lot of different rationales and there's a lot of different ways to explain this issue to us as a church. Um, we're going to look at, at this a little bit. But one of the key words, one of the key things that explains why we should be not ashamed of using the word slave, why either as a translator or as a student of the Bible that we would willingly accept and look and rationally it makes sense, there's a logical argument to use the word slave instead of servant, is by the terms master and Lord that are used over and over and over again. And when you have master and Lord that is used over and over again, we begin to see that, this, that there's a distinction between this. There's an intensity of the meaning that lends itself to recognizing the abject nature of slavery versus a mere servant-minded or servant-hearted action. You see there Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Romans 10, 9 says this picture. It uses the word Lord. If we declare him Lord to the glory of the Father, that this is the picture of us coming to know that he indeed is who he said he is. I remember as a kid growing up, we would sing Romans 10, 9 is a, very, is a favorite verse of mine, and, and it describes the whole picture of salvation. But listen to these words. In Romans chapter 10, in verse 9, he says, Because if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is what? Lord. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and, and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. So this issue of Jesus is Lord is very, very central to the gospel, and it is found throughout the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 6. And there's many, many other instances where this word Lord is used. Now, Lord indicates this picture of, as we also see the idea of master. Master. 
this idea of a, a lording over those that are there. Can a master and a lord be over a servant? Yes, indeed. But I want you to notice this. When the Holy Spirit inspires with the word doulos, and that clearly means slave, we need to be careful to be consistent with that. Now, in the time when Titus's letter was written, listen to this, there were 12 million slaves, doulos, in the Roman Empire. Slavery was massive. In fact, up to 20% of the people in various areas of the Roman world were slaves. They were owned property. They were conquered people. They were not Roman citizens. Now, if you go back and if you look at the Old Testament, this, this whole issue of slavery is throughout the Old Testament, and the, even God's people were made slaves. God's people, slaves in Egypt. God's people, slaves in Babylon. We see other people coming in, and and we see the the conflict between cultures. We see the conflict between peoples where there's slave and free man, and that is what very often the Scripture even draws those distinctions between slave and free. We see the Apostle Paul dealing with that. So we need to be careful not to dilute in key instances where it is here. Now, the Apostle Paul is saying unashamedly. I am a slave of God. I am a slave of the Most High God. I am I'm not merely a servant. I'm not just doing things for God, but I'm owned by God. We see that throughout the New Testament, so we need to be careful to look at it that way. And for us in this day and time, as we study the Bible, as we read the Scriptures, If we begin to look wherever doulos is used, is it appropriate that we translate it servant versus slave? We may see a deeper intensity of our identity in Christ that we are his. We are owned by him. And you say, well, is that a good thing? In fact, I heard, and as I was studying and reading, I heard about one pastor that was Uh, speaking in the American context here in the United States, preaching the gospel, and he was dealing with this. He noticed this in the scripture. He noticed this in his studies, and he was concerned. Well, I'm concerned about this because some people may not like that as well. I mean, I kind of feel the pressure that Knox, and I feel the pressure that Calvin was dealing with. People don't like to be called slaves. And then as he studied a little bit more, uh, he, he develop more of a conviction with that, and then he was asked to go speak at a very, very large conference for African Americans, African American Christians. And he was saying, wow, maybe that, that won't go over very well. I mean, this is, this is all the more real to them. They, they are aware of the history of this more than other people that are, that are there, and perhaps this would be difficult. And as he was studying and as he was looking at it, he came toward some of the things that we're going to see on this page, toward the bottom of this, and he came to see that this is one of the greatest things that I could proclaim to any person because, number one, this is the gospel. It is the word of God. Number two, the implications of being a slave over merely being a servant who simply goes and serves of their own volition is very, very different. The, the intensity of the blessings, the intensity of the identification with Christ, and most of all, the fact that Jesus leaves the halls of heaven and, listen, becomes a doulos. Christ leaves the halls of heaven, becomes a slave that we might become the righteousness of God. You say, Pastor, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that before. That's, that's so interesting. Well, let's look and let's see. Let's see what it says. So notice this. If you haven't already filled it in, I want you to fill it in, the third point there. The master-slave context of the Roman era was far more intense than that of the 1500s. That's Calvin and, and Knox. The stark reality of the first century should be no different than any other century. You see, when... Paul wrote these letters. When Jesus spoke these words, there were slaves in the crowds. 
There were people who were the recipients reading this. And we see even Paul dealing with that within the church in calling people to know how to respond to one another in this very real context. And I, and I believe that God, in his infinite sovereign wisdom and in his mercy, he gives all things to us so that we might understand more about who he is. And I think this issue of slavery is vastly important for us to see all that Christ has done for us through the gospel. You see, there are two great realities seen throughout the New Testament. These are seen throughout the New Testament. The first one, Jesus is Lord. That is the bottom line. He is the curio. He is the curios. I mean, it, it, he is the, the Lord, the king over all of the earth. He is the authority. And this is the verse that we just looked up. Because if you confess with your mouth that circle it there, I've underlined it, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, the, the Lord of the house is the one who is the Lord over those who are there. And in these contexts, we see that very, very often that meant full-on slavery. Just begin to read through the context of the New Testament. So the fact that we're using Lord and Master shows that there are slaves, and that's number two. Throughout the scripture, we see this intense usage so that there are Christian slaves. They are Christian slaves throughout the New Testament, and Christians are slaves. Not just slaves to a master, but slaves to the master. We studied the book of Jude um, last year, and it's very, very interesting. You remember the book of Jude is about those who are apostate. Uh, that there's false teachers coming into the church, and they're coming into the church to preach the gospel for all kinds of different wrong reasons. And we see at the beginning of the book of Jude, um, we see this picture where Jude tells us, look at verse 4, for certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, God's sovereignty working in all of this. These are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into even sensuality, and look what they deny. And they deny our only master, use the word master, and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, key word here is only. Circle the word only. You can know that he is talking about the the idea that Jesus is master and Lord, not merely from a servant's perspective, but from a slave's perspective, the only gives us the key. Because think about this. If you're a servant, you could have two or three different masters. If you're a servant, you could work for one during the day and you could work for another one in the evening. Some of you have two jobs and you, you do that. And you serve in, you, know, you serve in one business at one time and then you go and you have another work that you do at another time. And a servant can do that. In fact, there were many servants that would do that. But when we begin to see it within this context where he says that, Jesus, we, we, that these come and they deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ, this is from the perspective of a slave. This is from the perspective of one who has no other one that he answers to. This is so critical to us. I want you to see here, consider the radical contrast and the beauty of what God does in this. Jesus in John 15. This is one of those passages that I don't want you to tube out on. I want you to really pay attention. Look in John 15. Jesus is speaking, and he says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Oh, the beauty. Look at verse 14. You are my friends. Look what he says. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, doesn't that sound a little bizarre? What if I became friends with Daniel and I said, Daniel, let's be friends. You have to do what I say. That sounds like a weird friendship, doesn't it? I demand that you do what I say. I mean, Mike, you know, it, it, Mike and I become friends and Mike says, that's great, Pastor. I want to be your friend, but as long as you do what I say, then you can be my friend. So we, so we could misunderstand this. We could, we could look at this and say, wow, this is a, 
This is an interesting indicator of friendship, but this is the picture of a slave who has been in bondage to one thing being redeemed and coming, and his obedience shows his true relationship. Look at verse 15. No longer do I call you servants. I believe that should be slave. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my Father and I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. That means it's going to remain. It's going to stay. It's going to be good fruit. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Now look at the ESV note that's the official ESV note. On John 15... It says it's translated as servants, but it could be bondservants or, look at that, slaves. And and it says there, for the contextual rending of the Greek word doulos, see the preface. So here's the deal. The ESV is the only one that tends to go use the word slave more than all of the other English translations. Most of the other English translations only use the word slave in Romans 6 a passage that we'll see in just a second. They, they miss this great, powerful indicator of who we really are, and, it's, and, and it's, it's one of the great keys to the beauty of the gospel and the intensity of the gospel. I want to give you two reasons why we should embrace slavery to Christ that that is not a bad term, but that is a glorious term. And the first reason comes from Romans chapter 6. Will you go to Romans chapter 6? And I do want to ask you to turn there. I've only put a small part of this on the sheet, but this is one of those places where I want you to see it. We're going to see these. I think this is going to blow you away. Look at Romans 6. Take your Bible. Take your Bible. Open it up. Romans 6. Go to Romans 6 and see it. You see... In Romans 6, we see true freedom. In some of you today, you're desperate for freedom. There's things in your life that you think they just rule over you, and there's no way, and that's part of the reason you're here. You're kind of at the end of your rope, and there's, there's some things that you're really hoping to be free from. Maybe it's an event from the past. Maybe it's an addiction from the present. Maybe it's a habit that you just, maybe it's a mental process that seems to get you. Maybe it's a circumstance in your life, but I want you to see why Christians can gladly embrace slavery to Christ. Look at Romans 6 and verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. He's saying, can you just go ahead and sin since you're, you're not under the law anymore, you're under grace as a Christian? Just go ahead and sin. You know, God loves to forgive and I love to sin, so we got a good deal. You know, should we just go on doing that? Verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, properly translated, You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. Look at verse 17. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Verse 18. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness, I am speaking in human terms because of your your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves, that that means your body, as slaves to impurity, to to lawless leading, to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness leading to sanctification. This is talking about honoring God with your life. You're no longer in bondage to sin that you've been set free. Look at verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things which you are now ashamed? He's saying it was unfruitful. All the stuff you were doing, you look at that and you go, wow, it made a big mess. Middle of verse 21. For the end of those things is death. 
But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our what? Lord. He's Lord over the slave. You don't all, for those who are in Christ, your Lord is no longer sin. Your Lord is no longer your flesh. That's not what holds you, and that's not what leads you, and that's not what tells you to do what to do anymore. Instead, the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of being a slave of God is that you've been set free from the law of sin and death. You're no longer, as it says in verse 20, slaves of sin, but you are free in regard to that. Now, I, I don't want to skip over John 8, 34, and this is amazing. It's just on the screen. You don't have to turn there. But notice John 8, 34 and 36. I, I think I made it on the screen. Maybe, maybe not. I think I did. Um, but look at verse 34. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever and here's these, these beautiful words. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. So no longer, if the Son has set you free, are you, are you a slave to righteousness? You have been made free to live in righteousness. You're no longer slaves to sin. You are a slave to righteousness. Now, let me just share with you that when I was a freshman in college, I was really struggling with some sins that I just, I couldn't seem to overcome. And I remember um, it was so consistent, and it was so difficult, there were attitudes and actions, um, there were, you know, various perspectives that I had that I wanted to honor the Lord and wanted to, to be righteous, but it just wasn't happening, and it wasn't happening for a long time. And I remember in great frustration calling my sister in Birmingham, Alabama and saying, I can't do this. I can't be a Christian. This is really hard for me. And my sister said, Andrew, do you really understand the gospel? Because you keep making it out that you're the one that has to do this. You keep making it out that you're the one that has to claim victory over the sin in your life and she said, if you're really a Christian, I want you to know that Jesus has taken those sins and he's nailed them to the cross and he now lives in you and gives you the strength to obey. He has set you free from the law of sin and death. And I, I'll never forget that conversation. I, I, was, I was working out myself. Well, around that time, I began to listen to a pastor on the radio. His name was John MacArthur. And John MacArthur was preaching Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. And the title of the series was Overcoming Sin. And when I first started listening to it, I thought, oh, wow, this is how I'm going to overcome sin. This is how I'm going to overcome sin in my life. And the longer I listened and I studied, and we, day after day, I, I actually had my, a, a radio set up in my dorm room where I could record it with a digital timer. I had timed it out. It'd come on the This is before the Internet, guys. No internet. Couldn't just go find whatever sermon you want from 10,000 sermons. It, that, that was not, it, if it came on the radio and you missed it, you missed it. You're just out of luck. So that's the way it used to be. But so I had to record it right at the hour, and I would go listen to it, and I would listen to it over and over again. And what I started to discover was I'm not the one that's going to overcome the sin. The gospel has overcome the sin. It is the, the person of Christ who has set me free from the law of sin and death. And I started to realize that the more I focus on Christ, the more I seek to honor Christ, the more I let his life live through me, the more I would see victory over these things. And it wasn't very long before some of those things that were just giants in my life fell. And it wasn't me, but it was Christ in me the hope of glory. So I, I want you to see that true freedom comes from letting the Son set us free. 
The things that you've tried a thousand times and you can't do it, it's time to give them to God. It's time to give them to the gospel of Christ. It's time to say, this is not who I am in Christ. And I choose to look to Christ as my hope. So true freedom comes from embracing slavery to Christ. There's a second thing. One of the great reasons that Christians should embrace slavery to Christ is our, own, is our Lord's own example. And you can put on there not only his own example, but his own action, because it, it's not merely an example. It was what he did. And we see it in Philippians chapter 2. And this is the last passage I want to draw your attention to. I do want to ask you to turn to it in your Bible. Take your Bible and turn over there to Philippians chapter 2. There may not be another chapter that more consistently comes up in sermons um, in my preaching as Philippians chapter 2. This example of what Jesus did is the example of not merely a servant, but one who would come as a slave. Look what it says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, writing to the Philippian church, he said, if you have any of that, verse 2, complete my joy by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, being in full accord with one mind. He's calling them to remember together the gospel and to live it out. Verse 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only in his own, to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now look what he says. Here's the key. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or to held on to. But verse 7, he emptied himself by taking the form, and here it says a servant, but the word is doulos, taking the form of a slave. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and in earth. You see, this is a Lord. This is a Lord reigning and ruling over in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus came, and he takes on complete submission to the Father all the way to death. And he bears our sin. Now, the word that is used here is doulos. Six other words could have been used in the Greek language if it was merely a servant. Jesus does not call us to submit to him and to come to him as Lord in anything that he himself was not already willing to do. He submitted himself to the Father, and amazingly, the Bible tells us that he went all the way to death. He became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Just imagine this imagery. I want you to see this imagery, and I've written this out on your outline. Look at there on your outline. Just consider the imagery of a slave in chains of sin on an auction block. The master redeemer comes and purchases him with his own blood. The master breaks the chains of sin and frees him to righteousness and eternal life. And now the slave has been made a friend of the master. Jesus said, I no longer call you slaves. I call you friends. 
This is the glorious grace of God. And this is the grace of the gospel that Paul is saying, this will set people free. If they will come and if they will embrace God as God, if they will see him as Lord, and if they will see themselves as his servant, as his slave even, as we are owned by this master, this master who makes us friends. What a powerful picture of the lordship of Christ in our, you know, when when we merely see servant, there are times when, when we don't realize the intensity of our identification with Christ. But when we come to say, nope, I have no will of my own. My will is submitted to God. We see that in Paul's writings over and over and over again that he says, it's not me, but it's you. We we see the Lord Jesus himself on the night before he's going to be executed. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You see, that's, that's speaking as a true suffering servant. That's speaking as one who comes and shows us what total submission really means. The Apostle Paul is not afraid to identify himself to Titus, and listen to this, to all those who are going to read that letter on Crete, and for 2,000 years, all of us who are going to read the letter, recognizing that he says, I am a slave of God. I am a slave to the one who knows all things. I am a slave to the good master. I am a slave to the good owner. And I have been, listen, I have been bought with a price. My life is no longer my own. These are words from the New Testament all around the picture of doulos. Friends, the greatest freedom in our lives will come when we realize our lives are not our own. We've been bought with a price. It's not me any longer. It's him. And the life that I live in him, it is for his glory and is for eternity because he has given good things to his children. He no longer calls us slaves, but he calls us friends. How great and gracious a God.